almost 10 years ago, my now wife, then girlfriend, Leslie, forwarded me a tiny little two minute, 53 second YouTube clip with the email subject line saying, check this out. So I, I clicked the link, dutiful boyfriend, you know, uh, start watching it. And it's this tiny little animation of uh, a fox and a bear acting out the difference between empathy and sympathy. As you may have guessed, the little voiceover over this little animation is by Brené Brown. And when the fox falls down the hole, the bear is like, I'm right down there with you. I'm here in the hole. You know, that's empathy. The opposite is sticking your head in the top of the hole and saying, ooh, you fell down that hole. That sucks. Sucks to be you. That's sympathy. And that tiny little paradigm shift or little explanation between empathy and sympathy was so powerful that even today, almost a decade later, Leslie and I still use that metaphor all the time. You know, if we are getting into a heated conversation, sometimes she'll look at me and she'll say, Neil, come down to the hole with me. And she'll be hearkening back to that, that little clip. Well, turns out that little clip was the beginning of what became sort of like a, a, a third person <laughs> in our marriage, in a sense, you know, because, you know, after we get, we get married, we're finding out Leslie is pregnant. Leslie prints out Brené Brown's parenting manifesto and puts it up on our wall. Do you guys know this parenting manifesto? You got to check it out. If you don't, it opens with the line, above all else, I want you to know you are loved and you are lovable. And it closes with the lines, I will not teach or love or show you anything perfectly, but I will let you see me and I will always hold sacred the gift of seeing you, truly, deeply seeing you. That parenting manifesto, parenting manifesto, so inspiring that, you know, Leslie signs up for Brené Brown's kitchen table parenting classes. So these are like courses that Brené is offering to sort of uh, how to sit at the kitchen table and become a better parent. We end up watching her viral TED Talks together. I'm sure you have seen them. If not, you have heard of them, the Power of Vulnerability, Listening to Shame. Something like 50 million people have watched these TED Talks. I end up flying down to an event where I'm speaking like, you know, in the breakout room in the basement. Brené Brown is upstairs on the main stage as the sort of feature keynote, and I'm lucky enough to get to watch her. And she completely blows me away. I watch a whole slew of other speakers at this conference, right? Like tech CEOs, A-list celebrities, you know, the big name speakers, right? But Brené Brown was the only speaker at the entire conference whose speech was punctuated by standing ovations all the way through. I'm not talking standing ovation at the end. I'm talking like, you know, every sort of like 10 to 15 minutes she said something that just made the entire audience rise up and start clapping. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. And I came back home from that conference and said, I got to improve my game. <laughs> I got to get better at speaking. I just saw the best in class speaker in the world. So many of the tiny little nuggets of wisdom that Brené has dropped on us are, again, like I mentioned, has sort of immersed into the tendons of my relationship with Leslie. One phrase that we use that Brené sort of taught us is this idea of the story I'm telling myself, where Brené tells the story about how, you know, Steve's not interested or can't come to Wednesday night dinner with her family. Brené will say, well, the story I'm telling myself is you don't like my family. You don't like my parents. And Steve was like, oh, no, 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 I, I got, you know, I got hockey practice that night. You know, I, uh, uh, the phrase enables both people to sort of avoid the stress and, you know, miscommunication that so often happens in relationships. And so Leslie and I, to this day, use that phrase all the time. You know, the story I'm telling myself is you don't think I'm working hard enough. Or the story I'm telling myself is you don't think I'm helping enough with the kids. We use that framework that Brene taught us, and it has completely helped our you know, when we're navigating those tough conversations. A couple of years ago, Leslie was giving a speech at her former high school to the entire student body. She was understandably nervous. It stayed up late a couple of nights, like working on this speech. And so on the day of the speech, I got her a copy of Brené Brown's Daring Greatly. And I wrote inside, I love watching you daring greatly in your life. Um, there is 
there are, there is, there are Brené Brown books kind of strewn on our bookshelves and around our house, whether that is The Gifts of Imperfection, which has been beside our bed for a long time, whether that is Braving the Wilderness, which I loved and read, whether that is Rising Strong or her newest one, Dare to Lead. These books, of course, all number one New York Times bestsellers. I mentioned the TED Talks already. I have not mentioned the fact that Leslie and I watched, as I'm sure many of you have, Brené Brown's lecture, The Call to Courage which debuted on Netflix in 2019, that of course was kind of opening up a whole new channel for Netflix, in addition to also serving as a professor at currently the University of Texas at Austin. She is visiting there, but also has an endowed chair at the University of Houston. Brené Brown is no big deal. Also the host of two of the world's most popular podcasts. Yes, I am talking about Unlocking Us and Dare to Lead, where she interviews people like, no big deal, President Obama. President-elect Biden and Dolly Parton, which, by the way, if you have not checked that out, I highly recommend that episode with Dolly Parton. It is a wonderful conversation. Brené Brown is a northern star, a northern light, a northern star. She is like this beacon in the sky to, to me, to Leslie, to so many people around the world. I just heard Prince Harry and Meghan Markel saying they like love Brené Brown. So many CEOs are kind of always invoking her name and talking about vulnerability. And she is doing so much good in a world where we are experiencing higher ever levels of anxiety, of stress, of misunderstanding, of miscommunication than ever before. And so it was just a huge privilege to be able to sit down with Brene Brown, with my wife, Leslie, and have what I hope you will find to be an incredibly intimate and wide-ranging conversation about everything from how we honor our partners, the value of ordinary moments, how we actually operationalize love, and of course, Brene Brown's three most formative books. Are you ready, guys? Are you ready? Drum roll, please. Put the seatbelt on. Settle into the couch dent. Get the dishes going. Here we go, guys. It's time in Chapter 70 to bring you the conversation we've all been waiting years for with the one and only Brené Brown. Let's go. Okay. Hi, Brené. Hi, Leslie. Hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> it, both waiting for the other one. It, yeah. It's, that's, this is when you talk to two polite women. They just both pause and wait for the other one because they can't see each other, which I'm sure for Dare to Lead and Unlocking Us, you're probably finding challenging, right? Because you're such an in-person person. I mean... we. Yes, we do it all on, we do both Zencaster and Zoom. I really, I have to see people. Yeah. And so for Leslie and I, like we, we, we try to make it come to life. We got three mugs of tea here. What kind of tea is it? Red raspberry leaf. Red raspberry. So one of those is your mugs of tea. We're just all toning up our uteruses. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. The uteri, the uteri are being served. Yes. Leslie, of course, do uh, in a few months. And then Leslie, what's those things you made the snack for Brene that she can't eat, but she can smell? Oh, there's some peanut butter balls. I wish I could send one through Zencaster mm, to you. God, geez, that smells like that. That I was like, like that smells <laughs> really smell good. It. I'm like, I can smell it. Um, <laughs> like the, the it's, scratch it's low, and it's sniff. It's low carb. You don't have to worry. It's like very perfect. Low carb. It's like that's it's like my keto keto thing. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, did you just say you're due in a couple of months? Yeah, I'm having our fourth baby boy in January. Okay, that is so awesome. Yeah, we're really excited. So I really am toning my uterus. You are really. <laughs> yes. And my heart through this conversation, hopefully. Oh, I love that. Congratulations. That's, Thank you. That's a miracle. Yeah, it It's really weird when is. you tell people that you're having a fourth child. There's a massive amount of projection. We get asked if we're Mormon, if we're Catholic, if we're crazy, if we're stupid. It's just like an interesting thing to mm-hmm. mention that you're having a lot of kids. I'm one of four, so... It doesn't. You get it. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I'm the oldest of four, so I I mostly feel like a sacred bond with your eldest. Yes, I'm the eldest of three, so I've always felt a sacred bond with mm-hmm. you over your talks of being the eldest. <laughs> so oh. it's really funny. One day when Ellen, our oldest, Steve and I are both firstborns, and then one day I think Ellen was in fourth grade, and she, you know, we went to the neighborhood public school, and we were getting ready to walk her to school. 
early because it was her first day um, as safety patrol. And so she put on the orange, you know, <laughs> sash and she had her like flags. And Steve and I looked at each other and she, he was, we're like, the firstborn destiny has been fulfilled. Our daughter. <laughs> <laughs> safety <laughs> patrol. Uh-huh. Oh my gosh, that is so funny. You just mentioned Steve. It's interesting because I, last night we were talking, we're like, we don't do too many of these together. And, you know, for us to be married and to try to navigate conversations, it's kind of not new terrain, but it's definitely, I don't know, I won't say experienced terrain. Do you do, do you do much stuff with Steve or how? I feel like he's like Wilson in my life. Like he's like this over the fence <laughs> sage. Because at first, my first, my first vision that I had when you said Wilson was Tom Hanks's volleyball um, in that movie. (laughs) But then I was like, oh no, Wilson in Tool Time. Um, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I meant the I meant the over the fence sage, not the not the painted volleyball. Yeah, floating Um, away, floating away. That was tough. Um, No, Steve and I don't really do anything publicly facing work-wise together, but I would say we are each other's number one confidant and advisor and mentor and safe place, both for his work as a pediatrician and then all of my work. So we make all of our kind of big decisions together, but we don't, we have very similar, there's, we're, we're driven by a similar ethos of making the world a better place and a braver place, um, but very different approaches to doing it. So he's, you know, one-on-one in a room with the child and maybe the child's family. um, And I'm doing something much more kind of in the public and I couldn't do what he does, but I have mad respect for it. And he would not do what I do, but really respects it. So we have a, we have a good thing about that. That resonates so deep. Oh, really? Def- yeah. I mean, this is this is a little bit uncomfortable for me to step into such a public sphere with Neil. And, you know, my my tendency is always towards like really direct, small impact, mm-hmm. like one on one impact. Leslie's a seventh and eighth grade elementary school teacher in inner city school. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So and she- and Neil, you know, obviously is more public and and is very excited about how many people might listen to a podcast or might, mm-hmm. might you know, see an Instagram post. And I'm curious, though, how how you and Steve have come to that and how you find respect for each other in that. Because, I mean, as the person who is, you know, not as in the public sphere, sometimes I feel a pull from Neil to come towards the public sphere with him. Um, and then sometimes it also goes the other way to, you know, Neil almost being like, oh, it's, you know, it's so calm and relaxing that you are, that your work is so out of the public eye. So how, how do you guys navigate that push and pull? I think I pushed really hard, um, for about a year for Steve to kind of come with me. Um, and like, let's do this thing together and maybe we can do a book together. And what I realized is that I wasn't running toward him with an idea that really honored who he was. I was running away from feeling so alone in what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the thing is that there's not even a difference in my mind or Steve's mind around scale of change or our scale of impact because, you know, one or two people dramatically shifted my life, including a teacher, you know, including. And so he recently gave up private practice. Um, he had been in his practice for a really long time, owned his practice, sold his practice back to a partner, um, and decided that he was going to dedicate the second half of his career to working in really resource, really resource poor, high immigrant, um, overseeing kind of the medical clinics, working with nurse practice practitioners and really doing like hard work on the edges of love, you know? Um, and so I think, me wanting for him to come with me was really more about my work can be super lonely. Mm -hmm. Um, and it lacks the personal connection. 
mm-hmm. and it lacks some of the stuff that Steve has. And I wanted some of that. But once I realized, wow, what a loss that would be for the world if he started doing more of this, you know, you know, this is so beautiful, Brene. And I really appreciate your vulnerability in sharing this because for me, I don't think I've talked about this before. I love the work I do, writing, writing books, giving speeches, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes I got to say, I, I walk off a stage, you know, a bunch of people clap. I, I you know, I rush off to the airport and I, I pick up the phone. I talk to Leslie on the way there and she's in tears uh, from a deep hour long conversation she had with the sort of Afghan refugee uh, who's fighting misogyny within her own home and the ma- massive difference she's made for that one person to the point where we actually still get letters in the mail to our house from people like this. Mm. And I'm like a bit jealous, actually, of the impact while also wondering how much of an impact I'm making. Do, do you know what I mean? So I, I feel yeah. that too. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's such, there's so so many gifts in the work we do. Um. And there's so many hard things and so many gifts in the work that I think they do and so many hard things. So I think sometimes it's, I mean, my life is the same. Like, you know, at this point now I have security shuffling me off a stage into the back of a car to an airport, home, talking to Steve, trying to help my kids over the phone with homework, getting on the plane. Um, And we do, you know. Like we do the same thing. We get the same letters. We go to funerals together. You know, it's, but I think just to step back, this is a weird way to look at it for me, but I always think about, I had this incredible mentor when I was a <clears throat> master's and a PhD student and she sadly died uh, very young in her late thirties of breast cancer. Um, but her name was Karen Stout and she studied femicide, the killing of women by intimate partners. And I was the first person to have a qualitative dissertation in my college. And there was a lot of pushback. It pissed people off. We were very quantitative. And she was a quantitative researcher. And I went to her and I said, you know, this is, I want to do qualitative research. And, but I guess it doesn't matter. And she said, you know, it would be so great if all that really mattered were the numbers, the quantitative things, but you can't change people without the stories. And it would be so great if all you really needed were the stories, but you've got to have the numbers. And she said, don't ever, don't ever jump into this false dichotomy bullshit debate about qualitative or quantitative, you know, private or public, small scale, slow, you know, big scale. Mm -hmm. She's like, that is just not real and true and only serves one side of the people pitching the argument. And so I really think about that a lot, even as it pertains to me and Steve. Mm. Oh, we're just like looking at each other with like tears in our eyes already. Um, Brene, you that you know, you know, I said zooming up a level or pulling back a level. I mean, this is something you do so well. And you just gave us a nice little glimpse of like a little spectrum or, or whatever you call these things, like the teeter totter type thing that I just honestly had not thought about it like that before. You also mentioned a phrase about a minute ago. You said at this point, I'm um you know, ushered off a stage into a security car in the back of, in, into a limo or whatever it was. And I, I just heard you, you were speaking to President elect Joe Biden. I, I you know, pre- to prepare for this, I'd listen to you with Oprah so many times. You've also talked a lot about stretch mark friends, the friends whose names are in your wallet, people whose opinions of you matter. Can I ask, is there a spectrum that you think of or some sort of system or idea that you follow in your life when it comes to thinking about friendships today? Um, Steve, of course, being a great one, but also your partner. But I just mean like, how do you think about managing all the amazing intimate relationships you have? And the reason I'm asking is because as I, and I know a lot of people struggle with balance, we think about that too. And we, if I can be honest, I struggle with this all the time. What, what, So I'm curious before I jump in, because I really want to understand better. What is the struggle? Okay, so high school friends uh, meet for Zoom every every single Monday night. I haven't been able to attend one in about three months. And they're they're calling me out. You know what I mean? Where are you at? For sure. You know, blah, blah, blah. And I I can't say, oh, um, 
I'm preparing for a one a gigantic interview tomorrow yeah. with Brené Brown. Uh, you, you know, sorry guys, um, that just comes across as horrible. You know, it just comes across as so dismissive. Um, mm. Nor can I say I've got mm-hmm. a giant book deadline. I, I just can't parlay my work to my closest friends as important without it coming across as, um, you know, uh, triumphant or, or something like you know, no, like yeah, arrogant. No. And I don't like that. And I worry about those. I worry about you can't make new old friends. And I worry about that. It's so funny because this is where my introversion is so helpful because I just don't have that many friends. Um, To be honest with you, like I have a really big family and I work with both of my sisters. Um, One of them is my chief of staff and one of them is a a licensed social worker. She's a therapist and she runs our internship program where we, where interns um, facilitate our work with different nonprofits here in Houston. And so I'm really close to both my sisters and I have a couple of friends that have been around since kind of the very beginning, but that's all I really have. Like I don't have a long crowded table. Mm. Um, never, never have, um, probably never will. Mm. Um, I have a group of friends who do what I do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have, we, we get it and we have a shorthand. And so, you know, I think Austin Mm -hmm. Channing Brown, Tarana Burke, Liz Gilbert, Glenn Doyle. Um, so we, yeah. So um, we, you know, I have a short hand, they're, they're friends, but they're also friends where, you know, they don't really hang out with a lot of other people either, um, mm-hmm. other than their family and a couple of close people. So mm-hmm. I'm a pretty, I'm, I don't, I don't, you know, I'll tell you what was harder for me. So if we talk about like really close to the center, so I've got friends, like if you look at, think about three concentric circles. And you've got that center circle of that, the really close people. And in that really close people, you know, are my family and those kind of some of those girlfriends that I just named. Um, And then I don't have very many, if at all, in that outer, that second ring. And then my career has either for the third ring folks, either pushed them completely away or brought them to the center. Mm. Because yeah. there was a, yeah, there's a phase a of like, image. yeah. Can <laughs> I can you, picture can you people do... bouncing off your atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? You know? And, and I'm very much, um, the same person that started everything. Um, and so with those friends, when I say, you know, oh man, I wish I have a book deadline and I'm interviewing, you know, Neil and Vice Leslie, President Biden huge tomorrow. Interview. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm do, like, I'm doing something like that. It's funny because with my closest friends, they're like, "Oh, got it, okay." And I'm like, "What about Thursday?" And they're like, "Oh, God, no," because I've got this thing at work and I'm presenting. I've got to, you know, pick up uh, Jack for band practice, and it's all the same to us. It's like, yeah. it's all the same. And I mean, as we get older, and just as we have bigger families, and we have more things on our life, I think that's a very shared experience, right? Like our time is completely sacred. The people that get God, in and get to spend yes. time with you are are a chosen few. Yeah, and I'm I'm really the happy the two happiest places for me in my life are with my family, and that's a you know that's a small group, maybe eight or ten people, or alone with my data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I pictured the guy from Star Trek. Yeah, um, no, I mean, just- yeah. You know, one of the things that comes up for me when you're talking about this and when we're talking, kind of going back a little bit to what we were talking about with, you know, Steve being, you know, a bit more private with his work and the impact being more focused, potentially more qualitative. Um, Right now with, you know, Instagram and this like, 
easy ability for people to at least strive to be like change makers, you know, and to be Mm -hmm. so public in the way that they're caring, even caring for their family. Like I think of motherhood and that it used to be this thing that you, you just did in your family and with the moms at the park. And now all of a sudden there's this pressure to be posting the beautiful Pinterest thing that you're doing Ugh. for Halloween. Cause there's no trick or treating or, you know, it's all become even the like, here I am blow drying my hair and this is what I'm going to wear to pick up and how my mask matches my outfit. And this, this pressure to in a way like develop followers, but also in that is this kind of like lack of contentment where there used to be, I think a lot of contentment for people like speaking to mothers particularly, what would you say to those people who are wondering, like, how do you find contentment? How do you feel at peace knowing that you might know that your real legacy is going to be being a great parent or being a great teacher or being a great pediatrician or being a, you know, a wonderful, any of these jobs that people do and do it well and connect well with people and have great deep empathy like I feel so content with that, but I see so many people mm. feeling it's this lack of contentment today. because it's so public and because there's this way to show everyone what you're doing and kind of show off about it. It's really, I, I'm really, I, I feel like I'm so lucky in this area because of my research, because I think I, had I not done this research 10 years ago, and this is this research actually started probably 15 years ago, I think I would have been very vulnerable personally to the seductive nature of what you're talking about. I mean, I think we all we are all somewhat vulnerable to it, but the level of, you know, of narcotic it has over us, I think, is yes. it ranges. But I think for me, when I was doing the first research on wholeheartedness and just found these people that just lived with this deep sense of kind of love and belonging. And I, I had to start studying. I, I had to understand grief as part of that. So I did all of this interviewing. It was so hard. It was like a very kind of bleak six months, but not, but ultimately not, I guess, but where I was interviewing people that had experienced tremendous loss, like the death of a child, the, you know, violent, violent death of a partner, um, just really genocide, um, really hard stuff. And what was so overwhelming and what saturated across the data so quickly was how much the folks who had experienced this, this major loss and grief mourned the ordinary more than anything else. Mm. There was, you know, there was no, there was no talk about extraordinary moments. There was, man, if I could get one of those crazy texts from my mom, she just never really got the hang of the text. I would just do anything for that. Or if I could hear my husband come in that screen door one more time or watch my son play in the backyard or these just really ordinary moments that we take for granted because we're so busy chasing down extraordinary moments um, that we then just performatively show these moments for validation. And it's like that I was so, you know, those are hard interviews, you know, those are hard, you know, focus groups with, you know, grieving Mm -hmm. parents, you know, and I just was so struck by it. And I really vowed at that point, I think in my life to never take ordinary moments for granted. And that if I start, if I take a picture of one, which I can, cause I, I love photography and I love editing films and I have a lot of great moments, but then if I then share it and then check how many times people have liked it, then I've squandered this moment that is actually the fuel for my life. Yes. So you'll see that I don't share pictures of my children. I don't share family, really family moments. Like it's very rare for me to share something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're the, we're the exact same. There's no pictures and and stuff of our kids either for the same reason, but not articulated that clearly (laughs) before. Um, Thank you so much, Brene, for sharing that and going into these kind of opening. I feel like we just made a nice little 
opening little quilt of 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 connection there, uh, which is a really nice kind of environment to launch into your three most formative books. Um, I have uh, them sitting beside me for each one. I will give a little introduction so that the uh, guest or our, our listener can picture holding it in a bookstore. And then I will ask you to tell us about your relationship with each book. Yeah, that's great. Okay, it's a really neat you. idea, actually. It, it made me think <laughs> a lot. Well, I really appreciate you being up for the challenge. Uh, okay, Brenna, your very first most formative book is The Big Book by Bill W. Published in 1930. Nine, by Alcoholics Anonymous World Services, Bill W., or William Griffin Wilson, was co-founder of AA, an international fellowship with over 2 million members. The cover is a black background with yellow handwritten title and a small circle with a triangle in the middle on the front. Dewey Decimal Heads, you can file this one under 362.2 for substance abuse hyphen alcohol. Brené, please tell us about your relationship with The Big Book by Bill W., well, it's interesting. Um, I don't know if I have a relationship with the entire book. I have a relationship with the passage that's on page 85 in the big book. And I am sober and I, I, I guess I get, I have about, mm, I guess next year it'll be 25 years. And so, and sobriety was an interesting thing for me because I was finishing my master's in social work. And one of the last assignments that we did was a geneogram. And a geneogram is a tool that mental health professionals, counselors um, use to kind of put together a map of a family. And there's different shapes you use for people in the family and then different types of lines to explain relationships. And so I was making this geneogram and I called my mom and I said, you know, can you help me through this, this, uh, did I say enneagram? I don't, Gen if I did, I meant I genogr genogram. Yeah. Okay. I think it's just G-E-N-O-G-R-A-M. So she's It'll like, It'll be yeah. correct in the show notes. We're not worried about it. Oh, perfect. Okay. And so um, she's like, okay, let's start talking. And we start talking. And then, you know, hour one, hour two. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh my God, this is an alcoholism shit show. Um, mom, what is going on? And she's like, yeah, tell me about it. I lived through it. Um, cause my parents, my parents were not alcoholics and they were not drinkers and that just, it wasn't a big part of my life growing up, but grandparents, uncles, aunts, I mean, you know, all kinds of addiction, death by addiction, death by addiction, you know, related stuff. And so, and I was always a partier and always kind of a drinker and fun person. And it scared me to death. And so I thought, well, this is scary because now I know for sure, you know, there's that saying that uh, genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. Mm. And so I'm like, so I'm loaded for this for sure. I completely see a propensity for it in me. And I, you know, and I already have like, this was even before I got my PhD, like $70,000 worth of school loans from this graduate degree and my bachelor's degree. And like, I need to, I should quit drinking. So I said, I'm going to quit drinking and I'm going to go to AA. So I went to AA for a year. I quit drinking. Very funny story. So I go to, I go to my first meeting. They're like, it was like the Berenstein Bears, like big hat, small hat, little hat, polka dot hat. Um, they're like, <laughs> You're not, you're not drunk enough to be here in this AA meeting. You should go over here to this codependence meeting. And they're like, man, no, I don't think you're codependent enough for this meeting. You need to go back to AA. Or, I'm like, well, I use food. Oh, I'll try OA. So, okay, I'll try OA. Then they're like, no, you drink too much for, the, you know, I was like, Jesus, like, <laughs> like, like, can a girl find a meeting? Um, <laughs> and I finally go back to AA and... You know, you know, you're totally fucked up when you can't find a meeting, like a 12 step meeting. Like <laughs> you're getting how kicked bad. out of all the anonymous yes. welcoming groups. That are <laughs> totally. And for someone who's struggled with belonging their entire life, I'm like, <laughs> this is the bottom right here. Um, <laughs> so I go to a meeting and I, I, I just find someone I'm like, I, I don't care whether this is the right meeting or not. Like this has to be my meeting and you'll need to be my temporary sponsor because that's what the book says. You, and I'm like a rule follower. And she's like, okay. So we went to La Madeline for dinner and I, you know, she asked me a thousand questions. I answered them. She goes, okay, 
She happened to also be a therapist, which I thought was interesting because I didn't pick her for that. I may have picked someone else actually had I known, but she said, okay, what we have here is the poo-poo platter of addiction. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? And she goes, I'll need you to stop drinking, smoking cigarettes, interfering in your family's life and comfort eating. I was like, Jesus Christ. What's, what am I what, supposed am I, to do? Yeah. What do I do with the rest of my time? <laughs> um, and she's like, you know, like go. And so I was like, okay, I tried it. And she goes, and so I started going to meetings that lasted, you know, and I got sober, worked the 12 steps. Um, some of it resonated for me. Some of it didn't, but you know, as they say in the room, take what works, leave the rest. I, you know, and every time I found myself fighting stuff, I was like, eh, you know, it's, it's, it's a super gendered book. And it's like, basically the guys were in AA and the women were serving coffee. And so I had to look past a lot of that stuff. And, and, and deeply religious from what I understand. Deeply religious. Yeah. And yeah. at the time I was very, always, always a God lover, but very anti-organized religion. And so mm -hmm. That was tough for me, but I've always been a prayer and I've always been, you know, kind of a belief. I'm not kind of, I'm always been a very strong believer actually. So I could do some of it. I changed the words to all the prayers that I didn't like. So I was okay. But then I found this, this phrase, it says in the big book, should I read it? This yeah, little passage? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor we are nor are we afraid. That's our experience. This is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. And I remember my first experiences of neutrality around alcohol, around the bread basket at a restaurant where I was eating with my friends and everyone was, you know, eating their weight in the hot bread with the butter. I think it was the olive oil dip with the seasoning. And I remember thinking, I'm not running toward that bread basket and that wine as fast as I can, nor am I running away from it. Like, nor do I have to leave. It's just kind of a non-issue. It's just, it's not, Rendered I don't know. I don't moot. Yeah. I've got no, I've got no energy around it. Like I just don't have any energy around it. And I thought, well, that's an effing miracle. Like there's yeah. something, something's got to be true about this. A couple of weeks later, there was a crisis in my family and, um, I did a lot of co-parenting of my younger siblings, um, with my parents, which was completely dysfunctional and they had a marriage breaking up and it was hard. And I remember kind of my mom talking to me about this crisis that was happening with one of my siblings. And I said, that sounds really hard. And, you know, I hope y'all figure out a way through it. Mm. And there was just kind of like silence. And I just remember like my mom even called me back and like a day later and she said that you're, this is part of your recovery, right? And I said, yeah. And she goes, it's, it's amazing. Keep going. You've got my full support. It's just incredible to see. Like I've, and, and she's like, and she's, she came from a ton of alcoholism, a ton of codependency. And so she was just like, I, I've never seen anything like that. I didn't know people could actually do it. And she was so supportive and so incredible about it. But, but then it started to wane. And then I started like, okay, well, half a piece of bread. Well, what about if, you know, I'm not eating flour or sugar, but what if it's bread make out, made out of like, I don't know, chickpea flour, that's, you know, or, you know, <laughs> some bullshit like that. And that's then what really I realized, bread. yeah, that's not really bread. Right. And so then I, what I realized is I read it again. And then I saw that the neutrality was dependent on being in fit spiritual condition. Ah. And so I had to really define what that meant for me. And that's kind of the work of my lifetime, I guess, is that what does it mean to be for me to be spiritually fit? And it, what it means is a very robust gratitude practice. It means alone time. It means, it means acting out my love for the people I love in my life, not just professing it. It means getting a hang, handle on my anger and blaming when, when I get, when I get scared, I get scary. And Steve's often the recipient to that, which has been super hard to the pandemic. Um, and so I just kind of figured out what fit spiritual condition meant for me and did it. 
and you know, and I, I'm like, did it all done, just did it. And then I'm still working on it. Like this pandemic has pushed me out of that spiritual condition, pull, you know, sucked up all the neutrality, like a big ass magnet. And then I had to fight my way. You know, I stayed sober luckily with my, you know, with alcohol and I stayed sober with food, but I was, you know, right on the fringes of the behaviors that are not clean behaviors for me. Mm, yes. This is just all resonating so deep because just over a year ago, my parents ended their marriage and it's been mm. very painfully timed with everything to do with the pandemic. Um, because of course, you know, a family going through a divorce at any point is excruciatingly painful. And then to exasperate it by isolation and, you know, a, a global focus on setting boundaries and figuring out how to do that and how to honor what feels right for you and maybe not feel right for other people in terms of exposure and all this stuff has just been so complicated. And uh, when you say it really, it really stuck out to me when you talked about your sponsor saying that interfering with family dynamics is an addiction. Can you speak yeah. to that a bit? How so? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's kind of codependent. I mean, I think it's codependency. I think it is my well being is dependent on how other people are showing up and behaving. And that is, that is a disaster because the way I try to control my well-being is by controlling other people and mm. trying to control outcomes and situations. And, you know, I love Anne Lamott says that help is the sunny side of control. And, <laughs> you know, and I have a lot of that in me. And some of that, I, you know, I come by it all, honestly. Us, um, us as, eldest children. I'm sorry? Us eldest children. Oh, the, oh, yeah, that's it. I mean, that's why, you know, we come about it really honestly, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work. And so I can't, I can't be responsible for that. And um, I can't be responsible for parenting parents or parenting siblings or and, and they don't want to be parented. Um, everybody seems like it thinks it's a good idea until obviously it doesn't work. And then then you're the recipient of a lot of anger and resentment and frustration. And so I, I run a pretty clean ship over here. Like, um, I interviewed Elizabeth Lesser recently and her sister was a nurse for decades. And her sister's favorite slogan was, uh, take no shit, do no harm. <laughs> and, um, and I kind of operate that way. I'm a very boundaried person. And so mm -hmm. it's not unlike me to say something like, you know, we'd really love for you to come over there won't be any drinking or we'd really love for you to come over and, you know, bring your new partner, but explosive arguments are something that Steve and I committed to not doing as folks who came from them. So if that is part of the drill, that's not going to be okay. Like yeah, I'm really I'm, clear on what's okay and what's not okay. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes of yours, I don't even know where I read it, but is that some of the most boundaried people are also the most loving people. And that's just yeah. so true. Yeah. And I have become, I have become less sweet and more yeah. kind. Yes. Ooh. Yeah. Less oh. sweet, like, like, you know, less sweet talk bad about you behind your back and more genuinely kind, not going to talk about you with anyone, but I'm going to talk directly to you, even if mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable. Yes. I yes. feel like there's this constellation of things you are articulating in your work, Brene, that is like, I want as a picture of some kind of emotional solar system on my wall. And I'm so <laughs> desperate to tie in like the three C's and the, you know, the braving and I, but it's not even letters or words. It's like, I want the actual shape of the stuff you're talking about as some sort you, the way I will look at a dude with a six pack and be like, Oh, that's <laughs> what I'm going for. I want like the emotional, I want your emotional silhouette somewhere. Mm. Yes. That's so nice. Thank you. Um, I, it's just messy, hard work every day. I, I, I wish, <laughs> you know, you. It's, it's like you won't be able to stab it down and put it on a wall because <laughs> it's just messy and hard and constantly changing. And it's, you know, and I fail at it as often as I do it well. Um, but I'm always, I'm moving in the generally right, you know, so I always say about wholeheartedness, um, is kind of like the North Star. You 
you'll never get there, but you'll know if you're heading in the right direction. Mm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of a woman with an incredible North Star, I think Mm -hmm. it is time to introduce our listeners to the one and only Bell Hooks. Brene, your second most formative book is The Incredible Teaching to Transgress, written by Bell Hooks, B-E-L-L, last name is H-O-O-K-S, published in 1994 by Rutledge Publishing. The subtitle is Education as the Practice of Freedom. The cover of the book I'm holding in my hand is a yellow and orange dappled paperback with a small clip art of a ladder leaning against a (laughs) green wall on a red floor. In Teaching to Transgress, Bell Hooks, writer, teacher, insurgent black intellectual, writes about a new kind of education, education as the practice of freedom, teaching students to transgress against racial, sexual, and class boundaries in order to achieve the gift of freedom is the teacher's most important goal. Bell Hooks was born as Gloria Jean Watkins in a small, segregated town in Kentucky in 1952, and she's known today as an author, professor, feminist, and social activist. File this book under 370.115 for Theory of Education. Brene, please tell us about your relationship with Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks. So I'm a young doctoral student. Um, I get my first class. And I had read kind of I when I had studied, you know, critical theory and Paolo Freire and, te- you know, um, pedagogy of the oppressed. Her name had come up and I really wanted to dig into her work as I started teaching. And I started reading Teaching to Transgress. And it was just, I still have my original copy. I remember at night, I would sleep with it next to my bed on my nightstand with the, the back, there's a small black and white photo of her there was on my um, on my copy um, with the picture side up so that I could see her face when I woke up in the morning. And the picture of her with her hand over her chin. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's what I'm looking, we're looking at that right now. Yeah. yeah. And I... I knew I wanted to do something different in the classroom. And I knew the classroom for me as a student, especially as a social work student, had always been this very sacred space. And I had seen it done really well. And I had seen so many missed opportunities to do it well. And I wanted to be, if nothing else, and I still feel the same way, I wanted to be a great teacher. Mm -hmm. And... I'm teaching this class and, you know, the University of Houston is the most racially and ethnically diverse research institution in the United States. So this class is, you know, just as diverse as you, you just can't even imagine a more diverse class. I think in that first class, it was actually even an ASL interpreter. And so we've got, you know, black students, brown students, we've got uh, LGBTQ students, we've got poor students, we've got wealthy students, we've got, I mean, like... You've got it all. And I'm teaching social, I think I'm thinking social policy analysis. And I wanted to do it different. So I had a a kind of feminist pedagogy where you designed your own syllabus. You designed your own syllabus. You decided what, what things were, you know, what points were you were going to assign to different assignments and hold yourself accountable and I, I remember the students thinking, wow, we've got this young doctoral student. She seems pretty, you know, hip and she seems to be really excited and it's great. Then things started getting out of control. And then, you know, a, you know, there was a, a, a Christian student fighting with a Bosnian student and then a black student calling a white student out on privilege. And there were men fighting women. And I mean, it was just like, it it just became a, I I lost complete control of this class. And I remember thinking, I've got to control this class. I've got to control this class. And I would come home at night and read Bell Hooks. And she would say, not your job to control the class, not your job, you know, your job, you need to make these arguments productive, you need to create learning. And so I made this little sign that said, it was about the discomfort. This is she, she's the one who taught me about discomfort. Like, it, you know, I made the sign that said, if they're comfortable, you're not teaching. Oh, that's good. Um, 
But what I was letting happen is these conversations that were accusatory and, and hostile, but there was no learning. So when an argument would, you know, erupt, I would stop and say, okay, let's stop. We're going to take this on and we're going to lean into it for the next 30 minutes. Let's talk. And people would be like, no. And then another, no, I'm like, no, uh -uh, we're not going to flip from, from argument to argument. We're going to stay in this until we understand what's happening in the room right now. And it was so exhausting, but it, boy, I felt that liberation. Like I felt what it meant to truly not try to control students, to not try to control the environment, but to follow the discomfort and the learning. And it was amazing. It was magical. And it wasn't magic because it was just hard as shit work. Um, but Magic shit. Magic shit. It was magic shit. And I just, I fell in, <laughs> yeah, I fell in love with her and I fell in love with her ideas and education as the practice of freedom. This is a fascinating story. I've not heard you tell this before any, anyway. It's so interesting to hear. And getting comfortable with the discomfort, you even saying Bell Hooks taught me about the discomfort. This is amazing. You know, page three of this book, um, she talks about growing up in you know, segregated Kentucky. All our teachers at Booker T. Washington were black women. They were committed to nurturing intellect so we could become scholars, thinkers, cultural workers, black folks who used our mind. We learned early that our devotion to learning to a life of the mind was a counter hegemonic act, if I said that word right, a fundamental way to resist every strategy of white racist colonization. Then on page four, she says, school changed all utterly with racial integration. Gone was the messen messenic, messianic zeal to transform our minds and beings that had characterized teachers and their pedagogical practices in our all-black schools. Knowledge was suddenly about information only. It had no relation to how one lived or behaved. It was no longer connected to anti-racist struggle based sorry bust bust to white schools we soon learned that obedience and not a zealous will to learn was what was expected of us too much eagerness to learn could easily be seen as a threat to white authority now other than the 17 mispronunciations in there <laughs> um i wonder what your reflection was on that i love the diversity of of the classroom you're talking about she's saying it. this was a new idea for us right last we were talking about mm -hmm. this we're like this is interesting integration as as a as a sort of like you know lowering the volume of of the classroom and and not you know what where is it what is the stuff you're talking about the magic shit uh how does that fit with cultural uh you know respecting every single culture letting people learn in their natural mode of learning i'm stumbling because i can't well, letting quite, all uh, cultures yeah. fit into the yeah. classroom yeah well i think if the work foundationally in the classroom no matter whether you're teaching like you seventh you know seventh and eighth grade or you're teaching graduate students in social work if all work at its foundation is not anti-racist anti-sexist liberation work that I don't think teaching can happen. And so for me, I think that there is teachers as agents of control and teachers as agents of change. Mm -hmm. Tell us about both. Well, I think... I don't know that we do enough to prepare teachers, to be honest with you, to be agents of change, because there is, I mean, I think with standardized testing and the way we look, you know, again, Paulo Freire would call it banking education, where, you know, there's no critical pedagogy, there's no critical thinking, it's deposit, 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 and be able to withdraw and check on demand. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed memorization. To yeah, uh, memorization. Uh -huh. And as opposed to look, we all got to know our timetables, right? Like that, I'm not talking about, you know, the straw man of throwing out the memorization that is, is necessary, but I'm just saying that even when you're teaching something that needs rote memorization, you can help people understand the why and connect it to the realities of their lives. And so to me, 
this goes transitions. I mean, if I can transition into the next book, I think it, it, you know, the Bell Hooks book, All About Love, where she writes about a love ethic and that the biggest problem, you know, when I think about the world today and I think about the environment and I think about administrations all over the world leading from power over instead of power with and power to, and I think about violence and I think about all the stuff that's happening, um, you know, she, she calls that lovelessness, a pandemic of lovelessness. Mm -hmm. And I think in order to be an agent of change in the classroom, the foundation of that is love and liberty and equality. And Mm -hmm. so you've got to address those issues. We have to address those issues. You know, you can't teach poor kids without acknowledging the systemic causes and consequences of poverty. You can't, you know, because then what happens is it's about comfort and control. You're protecting your own experience, not making sure students feel seen and heard and known. And I think sometimes school systems, and again, leave no child behind, standardized testing makes it, make it, makes it hard. Yeah. But I mm-hmm. do think, I do think in the end, It's about lovelessness. Yes. And you have, so you have done so many good, amazing things in this podcast already. I'm going to do one epic, giant closing question and then over to you for the closing riff. Here it is. Uh, You beautifully transitioned us to your third and final book, which is All About Love by Bell Hooks. You were the first person ever in the history of three books, by the way, Brene, to pick two books by the same author. (laughs) So speaks to your love of Bell Hooks and how formative she has been to you. Um, You talk about love so many times. It had maybe been one of the most common words we have said or you have said this this entire podcast. Um, On page 170 of All About Love, you know, Bell Hooks wrote something that I triple underlined. She says, in her first book, The Bluest Eye, Toni Morrison identifies the idea of romantic love as one of the most destructive ideas in the history of human thought. Its destructiveness resides in the notion that we come to love with no will and no capacity to choose. The illusion of falling, perpetuated by so much romantic lore, stands in the way of our learning how to love. To sustain our fantasy, we substitute romance for love. The book, of course, is about the much wider definition of love. Um, Your work has so much about love in it. Uh, You wrote a blog post, Brene, in October of 2019 about the book All About Love. And two phrases you said in that blog post were, I can be skittish when it comes to allowing joy and grace into my life. I need to find a way to open that door more. And you also wrote, I need deeper, more meaningful spiritual connection. I need to rekindle things with God in some way that makes sense for me. Uh, Maybe I'll take a run at meditation again or renew my daily exam and habit. So the giant macro closing question, Brene, is how would you recommend people begin to learn how to love? And as you segue into our close today, we're so grateful for your time. Could you leave us with any final word of wisdom or piece of advice for all those listening who love your work and admire to be uh, or aspire to be living a more wholehearted life. God, you're just not going to let me off the hook here. Uh, no, pun, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, um, I think we have to talk about what love Love is an action. What does love, you know, I can, I can profess love to Steve or my kids, but when I don't prioritize my time with them, when I don't listen more than I talk, when I don't try to put myself into Charlie's shoes as a 15 year old navigating the pandemic or think about Ellen who is experiencing her senior, senior year at university, you know, and it's everything, it's nothing that she wanted it to be, you know, because of COVID. And when, you know, I think you have to think about how, how do we operationalize love? Cause professing it is so easy and kind of cheap, but what does love look like? Um, and, for me, I, I do, it goes, I mean, Mal, like I don't 
like we didn't plan this for all the folks listening, but going back to being in fit spiritual condition, I have to be spiritually fit and connected for me to God in order to live into love. And when I'm spiritually broke or I am spiritually exhausted or resentful, I can't practice love like I want to practice love. And so I guess my closing thought would be um, I don't know. I don't think we can give what we don't have. And I think we have to really examine what what does self-love and self-kindness look like in specific in terms of observable behaviors and practices. And then what does our love for the people in our lives look like? And I think when we examine those very closely, we're going to find ourselves right back in the center of ordinary moments, which are really the only moments that I think matter. Wow. So perfectly said. And uh, so grateful, Brene, for your love to us and to our listeners today. Mm. Thank, Thank you all. so much for coming on Three Books. It has been a real treasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. This is just me, just Neil again, hanging out in my basement with my backpack full of wires, sitting on the brown couch with the plastic yellow ukulele behind me, the guitar beside that, and a couple yoga mats and a, I guess I thought it was a leather couch, but it has been shredded to pieces. So I'm thinking that that actually was a plastic couch <laughs> beside me. Listening back to that incredible conversation with the one and only Brené Brown. Which quotes did you pull out of that chat? There were so many. It was like every single sentence like left me buzzing in the emotional silhouette of this incredible woman. How about this one? We take ordinary moments for granted because we are so busy chasing down extraordinary moments to just performatively show these moments for validation. In one sentence, Brene just like kicks over the entire like domino set of all of social media. <laughs> I love that. She says, I have become less sweet and more kind. That is a phrase Leslie and I have been talking about and thinking about a lot since this chat. She says, wholeheartedness is like the North Star. You'll never get there, but you'll know if you are heading in the right direction. And I like this quote so much because so much of what we're trying to do with three books is hold up North Star, set intentions, show direction. But because we're all living through the human experience, we've got amygdalas in our brains flashing and flashing fight or flight hormones all day. We, we've got the sort of ups and downs of, of the world. We've got anxiety. We've got the news kind of hammering us every day with sort of negativity. Like we got to we got to make this a ride. We can't this we can't make this thing perfection. We can't make this thing about getting to and staying in nirvana. We have to make it about feeling what nirvana feels like, feeling what contentment feels like, and holding those up as North Stars whenever we inevitably slip off course. Can we squeeze in a couple more Brene Brown quotes here, guys? How about this one? I vowed to never take ordinary moments for granted. If I start taking photos and sharing and checking for likes, then I have squandered this moment that is actually the fuel for my life. Or this one, I made a sign saying, if they're comfortable, you're not teaching. I love that. And finally, let me leave you with a sixth and final quote from Brene today. How do we operationalize love? Because professing it is so easy and so cheap. Whew. Oh my gosh. I am, I just like, I can't, there's so much here. Like it, it is it, it, in tiny pithy little sentences. She wallops you on the side of the head with like a phone book of, 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 of deep emotional resonant thought. It is unbelievable. This is such powerful, important work. And it was just such a gift to have Brene on the show. Listen, if you are aching for more, then you'll be happy to know over at threebooks.co, 
as we always do with every single chapter of the show, the show notes have so much more. All these quotes plus more quotes, uh, words of the chapter, words that Brene said that we went deep into, thoughts from her, uh, links to every single you know, thing we mentioned, of course, the top 1000 has the three most formative books, which by the way are, huh? What are the top 1000? What are the books she's adding to our top 1000? They are number 867, the big book. Um, now this was interesting because it's 867 because Rich Roll picked this in chapter 45. She also added number 794, Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks. And she added number 793, All About Love by Bell Hooks as well. And my four-year-old is coming up to me. And yes, do you need something? Um, it's time to do the puzzle. Oh, okay. I got to go do a puzzle, people. Thank you so much to Brené. Thank you so much to Leslie. Thank you so much to Brené's team. I'm talking to you, Gabby. I'm talking to you, Catherine. I'm talking to you, Barrett. And I'm talking to you, Murdoch. Thank you guys so much for listening to Three Books. And now, are you still here? Did you wait it out? Did you wait the couple seconds? If so, welcome back to the end of the podcast club. This is one of three clubs that we have for three books listeners, including the cover to cover club. People listen to every single chapter of three books and the secret club. I can't say much more about the secret club other than you got to listen along for clues. And the best way to get a clue is, of course, by calling our phone number, which is one eight three three read a lot. Let's kick off the end of the podcast club, as we always do, by going to the phones right now. Hey, Neil. I am a new listener. Found you through Ologies with Allie Ward. And I, my name is A.M. O'Malley, and I am calling from Memphis, Tennessee. I wanted to share my three books. East of Eden by John Steinbeck uh, is number one. I, it moved me, and then it moves me every time I read it. I, it's a birthday gift I give to myself because I start it again every year on my birthday and reread it. And I have done that 15 times. Uh, the second book is Catcher in the Rye. When I was a preteen teen, I read a lot of sort of pulp fiction, genre fiction, and then I read Catcher in the Rye and it really showed me what literature can do differently than quote unquote genre fiction. No shade. I still love genre fiction, but it changed my life by steering me towards high end literature, I guess you would say. The third book is Bastard Out of Carolina. Uh, that book changed me because I think books, especially for children, are either mirrors or windows mirrors in which they can see themselves or windows that they can escape through. And for me, it was the first time I encountered a book that was a mirror in a very powerful way that showed me that my trauma that I had experienced was not mine alone, that I shared it with others. And so that was an incredibly powerful and life-changing book for me to read. Um, thanks again. Love the podcast. Talk soon. Thank you so much to AM. O'Malley from Memphis, Tennessee for the phone call. Oh, what a, you know, guys, anytime you want to call 1833-READ-A-LOT and leave me your three most formative books, it's just a wonderful thing to play on the show. And there is, as as AM said, no no shade, you know, like no matter what you pick. And genre, genre fiction versus literary fiction was interesting. I was like, what's the difference in my head? I was like, what's the difference? Well, according to writingclasses.com, a genre is a category of literature, such as mystery, suspense, science, fiction, or horror. Each genre has its own conventions. Romance, for example, focuses on romantic love between two people and often ends positively. <laughs> literary fiction, on the other hand, is a bit trickier to define. and generally, it emphasizes meaning over entertainment. Literary fiction also aspires towards art. Of course, the abstract art is where things get tricky. What is art? In fiction, it can be defined as interesting and deep manifestations of the elements of the craft. What? What do you mean? How about dimensional characters, a pleasing arc of tension, evocative language, or thematic purpose? Okay. And then, of course, the definition goes on to say, well, a lot of books can be both. For example, Pride and Prejudice is a romance book that is also literature. But I know what you mean. It's like, you know, you can get into like a genre and just kind of go deep on that versus the sort of literary version. This harkens a little bit back to chapter four with Sarah Ramsey, uh, my favorite bookseller. Now, East of Eden. Did I ever tell you guys how I, I started reading East of Eden? I mean, I was at a bar one night and I was talking to a guy about favorite books and he like pulls down the top of his shirt and he reveals a giant tattoo of like trees, like a tree roots. 
And he, as he does this, the bartender, she runs over and she's like, oh my gosh, no way, East of Eden, that's the cover. He's like, yeah, it's my favorite book. She's like, well, check this out. She pulls up her shirt sleeve and there's a quote from East of Eden by John Steinbeck on her arm. Two people who did not previously know each other have tattooed on their body something about East of Eden. I stopped by a bookstore open till midnight near my house on the way home, picked it up, started reading it, and it was my most popular book of, I believe, 2017. So I have not read it 15 times like you, AM. However, I am feeling that one for sure. Um, Catcher in the Rye, I think most people have heard of, certainly a book I, I also love. And the last one I had not heard of, Bastard Out of Carolina. So just a quick little opening synopsis for those people who have not heard of it like me. It's a coming of age novel published in 1992 by Dorothy Allison. It's semi-autobiographical in nature. It's set in Greenville, South Carolina in the 50s, okay? Um, it examines the complexities of mother-child relationships, conditions of class, race, and sexuality, and there is a ton of different traumas that the title character uh, Bone experiences. I won't go into the deep plot uh, for those that are interested in checking it out. However, um, I just empathize with UAM because you mentioned it was a little bit mirror like for you and i just read the synopsis and it was like it, it was intense so sending you love and thank you so much for calling one eight three three read a lot as i always do if i play your voicemail on the show just drop me a line uh and we'll mail mail you a signed copy of any of my books just as a way to say thanks okay and now it is time for the letter of the chapter okay this chapter's letter is going to come to us from Johnny. I think that's how I say your name, Johnny. It's spelled J-O-H-N-Y-E. Hi, Neil. A few years ago, I heard the line, books are not trophies. At the time, it stung. I have books. I have bookshelves. I have stacks of books in my bed. I haunt library book sales and garage sales that have boxes of books. I have bathtubs of books, vacation books. Sorry, not bathtubs of books. Bathtub books, vacation books, boxes of books waiting to be read. Perhaps what stung about the quote was that books are precious in the same sense that proper trophies are precious. Books represent an accomplishment of the spirit of the author and the spirit of the reader. They may not be trophies in the person holding a tennis racket standing atop a chunk of marble sense of a trophy, but books are markers of physical and emotional connection. Books are personal in an elemental sense. Books are memories, milestones, laughter, heart lines, tissues that wipe tears away. I came to three books in early December. I am working from the beginning forward to the current chapters, alternating new and early chapters. I especially, I especially enjoyed the Davids, David Sedaris and David Mitchell. I have to finish a project by the end of the year so I can continue Utopia Avenue, which I picked up before I heard David Mitchell on your show. I want to thank you for your podcast and thank you and your composer for the wonderful theme music. Have I not heard yet or have you not named your composer? Who is that wonderfully creative person? Please do not shorten the lead in music. It is a fantastic cue to take a few deep breaths and settle in for thought and wonder. My best to you and your family. From Johnny in Texas. Ah, thank you so much for this letter. By the way, I have mentioned the composer before, but I got to mention him again. He's wonderful. His name is Roberto Ercoli, E-R-C-O-L-I. And over at threebooks.co slash FAQ, you'll find... Uh, his name, if you're interested in hiring him to do some work or learning more about him, his name is Roberto Bercoli, and he is a Toronto-based classical musician composer, in addition to the fact that he's an actor and he's like just in, involved in a number of the arts. I thought his work was really special, and I, of course, hired him to compose this music for the show. I'm so glad you liked it, and I'm so glad you liked the fact that I leave it long. We are, I think, the podcast with the longest theme music in the entire world. <laughs> And we like it that way because it is, as you mentioned, to help ground and center and get us on the same wavelength before we jump in to, as you called it, thought and wonder. Okay. Ah, <sighs> Johnny, drop me a line. I'll send you a book. Okay. Now it is time for the word of the chapter. And for the word of the chapter, let's head back to Brene. Number one, confidant driven by a similar ethos, don't ever jump into this false dichotomy, the level of, you know, of narcotic it has over us. It was like a very kind of bleak six months. Genocide, what saturated across the data so quickly, just performatively showed, then I've squandered this moment, was a geneogram. 
I completely see a propensity for it in me. It's a super gendered book. But then it started to wane. A very robust, right on the fringes of, I think it's codependency. I'm a very boundary person. I kind of feminist pedagogy. Yes, of course. We gave Brene the word cloud treatment. Head over to threebooks.co. You'll find a list of every single chapter that features a word cloud. How do you pick a word out of those ones? What's a group of words called? You know, like a group of crows is a murder. You know, a, a group of sheep is a flock. What's a group of words? You guys got an answer for me on that? One eight three three read a lot if you have a clue. But I'm going to pick narcotic. Narcotic. I'm going to pick narcotic. Narcotic. Yes, it is narcotic. Narcotic. A drug such as opium or morphine that in moderate doses dulls the senses, relieves pain, and induces profound sleep, but in excessive doses causes stupor, coma, or convulsions. Okay, Miriam Webster, we're with you on that. That's 1A. What about 1B? Well, it says a drug such as marijuana or LSD subject to restriction similar to that of addictive narcotics. Hmm. Okay, well, that's kind of the same definition, but that's not how Brene used the term. I think she used it in the example of the second definition, which is something that soothes, relieves, or lulls. I love that. Something that soothes, relieves, or lulls, such as, here's the example from Merriam-Webster, a public comforted by the narcotic of military supremacy. That is a word and a context that I do not use in my life. And of course, that's the goal of the word of the chapter to introduce us to sort of ways to use a word or the definition or etymology of a word that we don't know about. Maybe you did or maybe you didn't know that this comes from Middle French. Yes, it's not Latin or Greek like almost every word. It is French, narcotique, which originally meant dulling the senses and inducing sleep. Ha. Huh. Well, I hope we did the opposite with you today. I hope we did not dull your senses and induce sleep. Although sometimes it's nice to fall asleep to a soothing voice. Brene certainly has one. Uh, I, I just want to say a huge thank you to Brene. I mentioned her team. I gave shout outs uh, to Gabby, to Catherine, to Murdoch, to, to uh, Barrett, her sister that works with her. And it was just a wonderful two years. Yes, guys, it was two years that we were interacting and talking about putting this together. As you can imagine, Brene's schedule is packed to the nth degree but she was always so kind and gracious saying like we got to fit this in let's let, how can we do it let's do it we tried to do it at south by southwest but then that got canceled and then we were going to do it in person i was going to fly to houston and then fly, the pandemic so then we figured out a way to do it huge credit to Brene, huge credit to her team huge thank you to them and huge thank you to you this show is a labor of love guys labor of love we got no revenue on the show right no ads no sponsors nothing for good or bad that's the way we are and so we do this because we love it and what makes it special is all the reviews you guys leave the letters you read leave the notes you leave and if you are on this journey with me to uncover the thousand most formative books in the world and just getting a thrill from doing that thank you Thank you for being here. I am with my people. If you are with your people, we are together on this journey. Thank you so much to listening, for listening to Three Books. And until next time, as I always say, remember that you are what you eat and you are what you read. Keep turning that page and I'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody.